Hello, I'm Jeremy. Today I'm going to take a look at a game by the name of Wetlock Nof El Dorado or Race 2 El Dorado. And this is a race game for two to four players that plays in about 45 to 60 minutes. It's uh, published by Ravensburger in Germany right now. Uh, there is likely an English version coming, uh, but I would say that although there is some text on the cards in this game, you could play it just by using the icons if you have a rules translation. I was able to get a rules translation off of Board Game Geek. I'll put a link to that in my uh, comments, uh, the show notes. Uh, so like I said, the game plays in about 45 to 60 minutes for two to four players, and in it players are going to be playing cards. It's a bit of a deck building game if you played games like Dominion. It's a lot like that but with a race element where players are going to be needing to play cards with certain symbols on them and build up cards uh, in order to cross certain obstacles to be the first person to move their pawn all the way across the map to the city of El Dorado. The first play person to do that's going to win. Let me take a few minutes to show you how the game plays and I'll let you know what I think about it. I've set up El Dorado here as a two-player game using the basic setup, and the board setup is going to be very variable. The game comes with a number of these uh, tiles, which look like this, and they are all two-sided, so you can mix and match those to make the game more difficult or just add variety. Um, the game also, it does include in its setup uh, some instruction sheets that give you some recommended setups with like easy, medium, and hard um, terrain layouts that you could place there. And the game it plays from two to four players. In a two-player game, each player is going to get two of these figures, and the goal is to get them across all this terrain to the city of El Dorado first. So you have to get both of those in a two-player game. In a three- or four-player game, each uh, player is only going to be char you know, controlling one character, and again, they just need to get to the end first. Um, and this is sort of a uh, deck-building game, and it's a race game at the same time. So, like I said, players are just trying to move their figures across this board, and they're going to do that by playing cards. So at the start of the game, each player is going to get a deck of eight starting cards, and um, they'll be able to acquire extra cards from this market up here. So the way this market works, at the start of the game, there's going to be six um, cards that are available uh, to buy. They have a cost on them, and I'll show you how that works in a moment. And then if ever a stack of those is going to sell out during the... Uh, course of the game, the next player who wants to buy a card will be able to, if they choose, pick any of these other 12 stacks and bring that down so that would now be for sale. So that's that's how players are going to acquire more cards. But on your turn, it's, it's very simple. What you're going to do is you'll, you'll simply take four of your cards. So again, you start with eight cards. You'll take four and you'll play them. And now you'll be able to do the actions associated with these cards. So there are cards that let you cross specific types of terrain, like these machetes. There are even these gold. They allow you to pass through these villages. There are also um, ones that let you travel through water. And uh, then the gold cards have a second use, which would be to buy additional cards. So this player, for example, with their three machetes and the one coin they have, they could move their figures. So they might choose to move this guy one, two, three, and one, for example. Or, you know, they could split it among the two players. But that would be literally all they would have to do on their turn. Then it just goes to the next player. So this next player, they draw their four cards. And now they will get to move as well. So they might want to move here and here using these two cards. And then they would have two coins left. So they could move through this village, although you cannot move on to an occupied space, a space that's occupied by your opponent. Um, so instead, maybe they'll choose to buy another uh, card with this. And you can only buy up to one card per turn. So they might choose to buy this one here, which you could see it costs two coins. They have two coins on these two cards. And it would function as a wild of any of these three types. So that would just get put in their discard pile as in almost any other deck building game. And then that would be the end of their turn. And I should note at the end of your turn you're going to actually draw back up your card. So you'll be able to do some planning before it's the start of your turn. Um, now this player here, they have three coins and a um, a paddle to let them go through the uh, river. So um, the way that the costs work whenever you're paying these costs, you can see here, and I don't think I quite explained it, you can see here this costs one machete, this costs one coin, and in order to move on those spaces you have to pay those costs by playing cards. So this player here, 
everywhere they would possibly really want to go is surrounded by a machete. They don't have a machete. And same thing with this, this pond back here. So they'll probably want to use this turn to buy something. So they have three coins. They might buy this one here. And you can see that this is a machete with a power of three. Um, so they would buy that. They wouldn't have any particular use for this um, this uh, paddle card, unfortunately. Um, so they would end up discarding that. I should note that if ever you want to, let's say they had these cards in their hand and they wanted to go to the market, they would, could use these two as coins. And then any card that doesn't have a coin on it could be used as a half coin. So they could combine these two cards to make a third coin if they were purchasing cards from the market. Um, that's always a... a um, a default action for any card. So now it'll be back to this player, they have these four cards, and so on. So this is how the game's going to work. And something that I should note is that over the course of the game, there's uh, going to be some more complicated um, actions and uh, obstacles in your way. So first of all, I'll explain these. These are barriers, and they're placed at the intersection of each tile. And it's, they serve as two things, one a tiebreaker and then two a catch-up mechanism. So if ever you're on this tile here, before you can move on to this tile here, you have to clear this barrier. So this one, in order to clear it, you just need to pay one paddle uh, icon. And this one here, for example, you would just need to pay one coin. That will clear the barrier for all players, but then you'll keep that off to the side. And if ever the uh, at the game end, and the game ends once... A player gets all of their figures, or one figure if you're playing with three or four players, over here to El Dorado. Um, then this will be the tiebreaker, the number of these that you've collected. So it works really well as a catch-up mechanism, because only the first player who crosses that line has to pay for it. And as a uh, tiebreaker, an incentive to push ahead. Um, so whoever collects most of those would win in a tiebreaker. If they were still tied for quantity, uh, they have numbers on them. Whoever has the highest number of these would be the winner. So the second thing I guess I'll explain are these. So this is called this is basically considered an advanced variant, um, but these are cave tiles. And the way that those work, whenever you move next to a cave for the first time, you get to claim one. And these will give you one-time use um, ability. So this would be essentially a one-time use of a power to uh, paddle. Some of them will let you transform cards into other cards, like this one here, to let you, lets you change the symbol on a card you play. Other ones, like this, would allow you to move into a space without paying the cost to move into it. So some of those could be really powerful. And the way those work, like I said, you have to move onto a space. You could then move away from it, not into another adjacent space, but if you move, for example, here and then back next to it, you could claim another tile. And that could sometimes be really useful. Um, because those can be powerful, and you're able to spend those uh, f freely on your turn to augment any card play. The uh, third thing I I'll explain are these spaces here. So these red spaces, they have a card depicted with an X on it. So if you're uh, going to go onto that space, the way those work is that in order to travel onto it, you have to discard a, a card out of the game entirely. So, for example, you might get rid of this card, and then you could go onto that space. And the nice thing about that is it gets a, a weaker card out of your hand, but potentially it could be, you could be in a position where you have to discard multiple cards. Uh, some of these boards, for example, this space all the way over here, you would have to discard three cards in order to go onto that space. So that could be uh, quite expensive if you have the wrong cards in your hand at that time. Um, there are some other spaces here, for example, these gray spaces. They have a discard symbol on it, but you, it's not a discard symbol with an X. So simply, you will just discard those cards for your discard pile to move on to it. So if I was here, and I had you know four cards in front of me, I could simply uh, discard three cards like this, one, two, three, to go one, two, three. And I would obviously claim that token for moving past that cave. Um, this here, uh, then you would be able to spend to go only to here because you would be blockaded by that. So uh, essentially players are going to be constantly trying to um, navigate these various spaces and in order to better do that they're going to be buying these bare cards. Um, at, in this basic setup most of the early icons are, are very low cost but you could see, and let me just pick this up to make it easier for you to see, um, Eventually, there are going to be spaces here that have multiple 
uh, icons on a single space. And the way that those work, um, if you want to go onto this space here with three machetes, you would have to play a card with at least three machetes on it. So for example, this card here will allow you to move from here to here. What you could not do, however, is combine like this three ones and move from here to here. You could go one, two, three, that's fine, but you, in order to move on to a space that has multiple symbols, so whether it's two or three or four in the case of this coin space, you would need to play a card with that many symbols on it. Um, so it actually becomes quite uh, challenging to move through some of the tougher terrain. Uh, so let me just show you some of the various cards that you could possibly buy because this is not a terribly complicated game. So for example here, this set of cards here, um, they allow you to move across the, uh, f I guess, jungle spaces more quickly. So there's a 2, a 3, a 5, and then the 6 one, and some cards have this uh, icon on it, it allows you six movement through jungle spaces, but you have to immediately discard it out of your out of the game entirely. So it's a one-time use card, but it is cheap. It's only three coins for that, whereas the five one you could use multiple times cost five coins. And getting five coins on a single turn can be difficult. So those would be some of the... Similarly, there are cards for money that do the same things. So there's a two money, a three money, a four money, and then a one-time use four money card. There are more of those wild cards, so again, these could be used as machetes, as paddles, or as coins. And there's ones that have a value of 1, ones that have a value of 2, and then one-time use ones that have a value of 4. There's a upgraded uh, captain who will allow you to travel along rivers more quickly. And depending on the, um, the board setup, uh, which again is going to be pretty randomized, I guess, at the start of each game, you will be, you'll have more use for some of these cards than others. And you also have to remember that there's only a few copies of each. There's only three copies of each. So if other players buy them, especially in a uh, three or four player game, you may not get the chance to buy those cards. So you can't really just plan around any single card. And then there are these special cards. And I should note that these do have some German language on them. I have a rules translation I got off of Board Game Geek. Um, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. But the iconography makes it so the text is pretty irrelevant once you learn them one time. So this one here, this camera, uh, it allows you to discard this card, play it normally, and then take any card, whether it's available in the uh, current market or in the future market. Um, this one here, you just play it and then you draw two cards, so that's nice. So a more powerful version, play this, draw three cards, but you only get to use it once. This one, like that token, allows you to move into a space without paying the cost for a single space. Um, and then this is uh, add two cards to your hand, and then you could discard two cards out of the game. And similarly, this is a weaker version. Add one card to your hand, and then discard a card out of the game. So those are essentially all the powers that you have at, at your disposal. Uh, the game will take you know about 30 minutes or so to run through, but if you play on a more complicated uh, board, it'll take maybe closer to, to an hour. Um, and it's simply a race game. First person to reach this last tile, the uh, city of gold, El Dorado, will be the winner. Oh, I will start out by saying that the very first time I played uh, this game, I found that it was a little bit simple. I thought that... Um, well, there's not that much going on here. It's very obvious each turn what my decisions are going to be. And I, I, I'll note, though, that I was playing in a two-player game where you have two pawns, which both adds strategy and also gives you an out if you have a bad draw because you could split your draw among your two different pawns. Um, but also I was playing with the basic setup, which is not terribly interesting for somebody who's played a lot of board games. I think it will work very well for a family uh, game, especially if you're playing with uh, more players, I would say, because there's more chance of being blocked and having to take an alternate path. Um, but in a, a uh, two-player game where you have two pawns to move, and um, if you're you know, an experienced board gamer, which I, I am, uh, it seems relatively obvious. So at the first I was like, this game, is, it seems like it works, it works well, but it seems very simple. And uh, then I happened to play again, uh, with you know one of the most difficult uh, maps that they suggest in the rules, and 
then all of a sudden the game really opened up to me and I saw the you know potential. I'm not saying that's a heavy strategy game, but all of a sudden um, I was you know essentially having turns where I was being forced to buy a card because I had no good move on the board. Um, I was uh, having to plan ahead more in considering what cards I was buying to you know deal with obstacles that might not come up for you know another two or three turns, and. I like that the game has that scalability, but I'm worried that a lot of people will just, you know, the first time they play it, play the basic setup and maybe think that the game is not very challenging. It's, again, it's not the hardest game in the world, but there is more here than meets the eye the first time you're going to play it. And it has to do with, you know, using the harder sides of these boards, um, it, which are, you know, all dual-sided. And generally there's an easy and a hard side. And I, you should note that they have in the center of them a little letter, so you could... Um, you know, follow the instructions from the book to recreate the layout. Um, but, you know, some of them are really devious. Some of them have, like, uncrossable spaces. You can see this one here. It has a large number of these mountains. You just can't go through. So you'll really have to think about how you're going to get through those spaces. Um, and other ones, you know, they have opportunities. You, you get cards out of your hand, you know, forever um, in order to do a shortcut. Uh, sometimes there's an upside to doing that, getting weak cards out of your hand so you can move along faster. So there are definite decisions to be made. But I think that you have to play on one of the harder boards for the game to become truly challenging. Now, so that being said, of course, not every family who's looking for a board game is looking for a game that's going to make their brain burn. And I think that the game, if you're playing on an easier course, or even, you know, um, if you're playing especially with two players, it becomes easier, and that that's okay. Um, I guess, like, I'll also say, again, that although this game does have text on the cards, you don't especially need that. If you print off the the rules, um, you could easily just, you know, use that to figure out how to how to play the game. The, all the cards, even the ones with text on them, have icons which are very obvious. Once you've you've seen the cards once, you're not gonna run into trouble with, with the language um, dependence in this game. Uh, I hope though, however, there is going to be an English version because this is a pretty strong family game. Um, I think that even on a harder difficulty, it might be slightly lighter than I, I would prefer. Um, but it, I think it does work well for what it is. Um, to me, this is, if you've ever played the game Lewis and Clark, The Discovery, which is a similar game where you're going to be building up a deck full of hands to move through terrain types over the course of the game, or a deck full of cards, rather, to move through different terrain types. This has a little bit of a feel of that, but it's much easier. That game, to me, is um, at sometimes a little bit too much plotting required and too dependent upon the uh, card draw. And here, I think that it's um, a breezier game. It's a, a game that has a, a lot of similar mechanisms to that game, though, however. And I think that's a pretty well-regarded game this would be essentially a gateway version of that. So, um, I think that this is a game that definitely has an audience, and it's probably an audience of more uh, casual or introductory gamers, but it's a game that also will expand with them as they continue to play it, so they could start on the easy levels, work on to the medium levels, and then you know, eventually be challenged by those hard levels. If you're a hardened gamer, you might want to just start on the harder levels. So I would say that those are my thoughts on Race to El Dorado, and thanks for watching.